If you were to draw a picture of blonde ambition, it would probably look something like Slingshot founder Annette Presley. South Auckland born and bred, Annette's entrepreneurial career began in her teenage years, collecting lost balls at her local golf course. These days, she's one of New Zealand's most prominent businesswomen and has been described variously in the press as the Xena of cyberspace and the woman most likely to take over the world. Health TV had a chat with Annette about what she's learned in the intervening years on the road to success. Annette started professional life as a computer programmer in 1980 before moving into recruitment. She moved steadily up the ranks of her firm, becoming one of its top consultants, but by 1987 felt she was ready for a fresh challenge. In October that year, she gave up the security of a good salary to start up her own IT recruitment business. Annette was 24, the stock market had just crashed, and she was stepping into the business world at a particularly bleak time. To be blunt, I don't have a business degree, but I believed in myself and I surrounded myself with people that believed in me. And I felt the fear and did it anyway. And I believed that I could succeed in recruitment. I was already a top recruitment consultant. And I felt fear, I felt scared, but I passionately believed that I wanted my own business. It had been my dream since I was 17. So at 24, I went out and took everything that everybody said to me, mainly that I'd fail. <laughs> and I felt the fear and did it anyway. Five years later, Annette and her then partner embarked on an even more ambitious project, moving to Australia to start its first telecommunications voice reseller, Call Australia. To begin with, progress was anything but to plan. We arrived in Australia with um, the PC, the UVD, the yellow pages, some plastic furniture, blow up mattress because the container hadn't arrived with our furniture, and some really big dreams. And the things that went wrong over the, the first few months of that business were enough to send most people scuttling back home. Business partner to be backed out, he thought it was too risky. Our supplier to be backed out, they thought it was too risky. Um, we nearly went broke three times. Telstra couldn't bill us properly, we couldn't bill our customers. Um, God, we had no office. <laughs> And on top of that, I've broken my leg in a car accident. But as the saying goes, when the going gets tough, and Annette looks back on the early days of Call Australia, if admittedly in rosy retrospect, as valuable experience. So what I learnt in the startup business was many things. First of all, um, if somebody tells you that they're an expert, it probably means um, that <laughs> Uh, X is an unknown quantity and spurt is a drip under pressure because um, most of the experts came to visit us to tell us we'd fail. Um, in a startup business, I think the most important thing is to have belief in yourself, but I think that's the most important thing in life. The other things that I learnt were you have a business case, make sure that you're committed to it, um, submit it to your lawyer, to your accountant, to your bank, um, make sure you have all the skill sets covered. Uh, my background is sales and marketing. I recognised that I needed a strong um, IT accounting partner, somebody who was, was um, covering all the other skill sets and starting up a business. Be prepared to change your business plan, even though you've committed to it, and be prepared to be flexible. And I think that's one of the keys to success that we've always had. Go out and listen to your prospects and your customers. If they tell you that they want a, a red gadget and you've got a white one planned, well, change it and make it red. And, and add value, provide more for less. And that's something that we have always done in every business. And we believe that that is a key to success. Another lesson Annette had to learn quickly when launching Call Australia was the creed of startups everywhere. Fake it until you make it. I mean, I remember going to presentations to Oracle, one of the largest computer companies in Australia, and going through exactly how we would structure the service, the billing system, how we we're going to save them money, how we we're going to increase their productivity by um, reducing their costs 40% and uh, providing an online billing system that was incredible um, and telling them about you know, our histories in New Zealand and how we were going to be wonderful for them. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea how we were actually going to produce the end product. It's amazing what becomes possible if you see possibilities and not obstacles and obstructions. Fake it till we make it, I faked it every single day. But guess what, we then delivered on everything that we promised and more. Just six years after starting Call Australia, the company was turning over $100 million a year, employed 200 staff and operated in every state. There was no need for Annette to fake it anymore, she had made it. However, 
In 1998, Annette decided to move back to New Zealand. Her reasons anything but financial. We came back to New Zealand after we sold Call Australia for one key reason, I was desperately homesick. And I'd had a little boy and I wanted to bring him up in New Zealand. And I'd been homesick for years. Um, the opportunity came up, I lost a baby, and my business partner came to visit me in the hospital and said, why don't we sell the company? And I said, yeah, can we do it yesterday? We sold the company in seven days, which they still say in the press is a record internationally for selling a telephone company in seven days. We signed a non-compete in Australia, which ran out several years ago, um, and we came home. And it's one of the best things I did, apart from the weather, which is disgusting. Having set up Call Plus two years prior to her return, once back in New Zealand, Annette set off on another pioneering business mission, starting New Zealand's first free internet service provider, i for free But in the year 2000, the business hit trouble. Telecom began restricting access to i for free and disconnecting users from the service. Annette faced a serious dilemma. Take Telecom to court, one of New Zealand's biggest companies, or watch her business get squeezed out of the picture. When we first decided to take Telecom to court, it was a really tough decision. One of the toughest we I've ever made. Um, and I remember the night that we decided to do it, my business partner said to me a simple phrase that I remember all the time now. <laughs> and it is, what's the worst thing that can happen? And if it's not that bad, then feel the fear and do it anyway. And the other thing that we went through and I went through in my head is, can it possibly get any worse than what it is now? And the answer had to be no. Our relationship with telecom was such that we could not be in a worse buying position. We could not get a worse level of service. So on that basis, we went ahead and we felt the fear anyway. We launched I for free, they cut us off. We launched it again, um, we went to court, got an injunction. We're the only company to have ever been in that position against telecom. I looked across the courtroom and we calculated there was $25,000 an hour worth of legal power being thrown back at us by telecom. And who were we? Just this little company who had a lot of guts, big balls, some people said, and at the time I thought a lot of stupidity to be fighting this huge monopoly who could just crush us whenever they chose. But we came to a point where we decided that somebody had to stand up, and for us I for free transcended the boundary of um, business and public cause, it really did. And our staff stayed up around the clock trying to keep the service operational because telecom were consistently cutting us off or limiting the access for our customers so they couldn't get through. But our staff, they worked around the clock, they didn't um, do it because we told them to. We brought in blood mattresses and pizzas and you know what, that, that company um, became the birth child of Slingshot and I'm really proud of that and I'm proud of those guys. Um, many of them still work here at Slingshot, you know, and they, they made Slingshot what she is today. So why didn't we throw on the towel? Because we believed that it was more about providing freedom of choice to New Zealanders um, than it was about making a profit, which we didn't <laughs> at the end of the day. Needless to say, Slingshot survived and continues to prosper with Annette at the helm although she remains at war with Telecom if engaged in a different battle. All this, and she still does the morning school run. Managing her time has taken some practice. One of the things that I've learnt in my life is really important is prioritising. And my children are, they're my first priority. No, they're my second. Myself is my first, my children are my second. I really think it's about, first of all, learning how to say no, which particularly as a woman that can be hard to do without feeling guilty, which we all own that, that, that particular state of mind as a woman, and recognising that you're important and then saying these are the things I'm going to do and not feeling guilty when someone says, you didn't return my email, you didn't return my text, don't you think I'm important, saying, I'm really sad that you feel that way. <laughs> But you know what, today I'm going to spend it with my children or I'm going to go and help this charity or I'm, you know, I'm going to do what I need to do that's good for me and that, that is important in my life. And you know what, some days I get it right and some days I just get it wrong. <laughs> so yeah, that's about it for me. Despite the pressures on her time, Annette regularly says yes to charity work, an area of her life she finds has brought its own rewards. Charity work is important to me because I really do believe that it's important to give back. Um, I really 
and I find that the more that you give back, the more you get. Whether that's through mentoring people and helping them to achieve their dreams, or whether it's through giving your time and your energy or your money to people who are less fortunate than you. I have children, so that's obviously an area that I'm really supportive of helping out in. Um, we have the third highest rate of domestic violence in the world, and so I'm a great supporter of those charities. Um, I was brought up in South Auckland, and I know that most of uh, the children that get seriously sick, in fact, I think it's 75%, um, are domiciled in South Auckland. They're the people that can least afford the care. So that's why I support Kids First, Dress of Success. When I was a little girl, we didn't have any money. My grandma gave me a suit, and that's how I got my first job, and she paid for my haircut. So that's why I got involved in Dress of Success. I believe clothes aren't just actually what you put on. They can change how you feel about yourself, how other people see you, and they can help you succeed or fail. So that's why I got involved in that one. Women in Technology. Again, when I first went into business, there just simply weren't women in business and I've always been an advocate of women in business. So Women in Technology is a charity that I support because we help women to succeed in business and that is really important to me too. So that's why I'm involved in those ones. Yeah. So what's next for Annette? Well, certainly not retirement. I don't see retirement as a goal. In fact, um, I would like to redefine the word work in the dictionary. I think work is something that people do like, I don't know, maybe unload wagons and they hate it or stand on street corners maybe giving cars tickets because they park there for too long. I mean, I don't particularly like those people. But I think that what I do is something I love. And what I teach people in the speaking that I do around the country is if you don't feel passionate about what you do in the morning, then don't, don't do it. Change jobs. You know, Twelve people at Telstra Clear resigned after I gave that speech. But I really believe that you should do what makes you happy and is fun. And sure, I don't do that all the time. I still have to, you know, deal with people like telecom and accountants and people that really don't make me smile. But most of the time, I love what I do. And when I don't love what I do most of the time, then sure, I'll go to Fiji and retire, which I still don't think I'll ever do. Um, but I love what I do, and it's making a difference. I for Free made a difference. Um, Slingshot's making a difference. We're making a difference in this industry and in New Zealand. And, you know, what's the point? If you can't make a difference, then why bother getting out of bed? Although she knows better than most that it is not simply attained, the secret to success, as far as Annette is concerned, is uncomplicated. If you've got a passion and a desire to do something, you can do anything. If you want to be a business person, you can do that. You don't have to have a degree. I mean, look at Bill Gates, who's dyslexic. There are many successful business people who necessarily, you know, who who ne shouldn't necessarily be successful, but they are. I believe that if you've got a passion and you want to do that, if you want to succeed in business, then anybody can do it. It's not born, it's up to you.